all across the world, people go missing every day. In my opinion, this must be one of the most heartbreaking and harrowing experiences for the loved ones left behind. As human beings, a lot of us need closure. We need answers, especially when it comes to our loved ones or just people we've loved in our life. And for me, if I had to imagine, probably one of the most hardest spiritual journeys to go on would be finding closure for the disappearance of a loved one where there was absolutely no evidence or clues as to what happened to that person. Today on Mystery Monday, we are going to be talking about a woman who went missing 35 years ago. And still to this day, no evidence has been revealed to show us what happened to her. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Without you guys, we truly would not be able to do what we do. The battle is real and shadow banning is very real. And so I personally am very, very appreciative of all of you guys who support what I do each and every month. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we are going to be talking about the disappearance of Julie Wefflin. Julie Wefflin disappeared on September 16th of 1987. At the time of her disappearance, she was happily married to her second husband and was only 28 years old. Julie Wefflin was not a big woman. She was only 5'2 and around 100 pounds. My mother is 5'2". And so it's interesting to think about Julie Wefflin's height and how tiny she was when she went missing, my, my dad, as I've said before, the Watson side of my family are really tall. My dad was like six, three, six, four. And especially with her only being about a hundred pounds, this was a very easy human being to abduct, which is important to remember as we go into this case. Julie Wefflin was originally from Portland, Oregon. She was born on May 3rd of 1959. Now, Julie had a very interesting childhood, and this was because of an issue that Julie had with her spine. This was a pretty intense issue, and when she was 14 years old, the doctors had to put her into a full body cast for six months to try to correct her spine. It is said that Julie, for these six months, could only be in two different positions, standing up or lying down. Now, many of her family and friends say, as a testament to Julie's overall spirit and attitude, that during this time, she never really complained. She always had a smile on her face, but it seems like this incident when she was 14 with this full body cast really affected her life. I mean, how could it not? Before this, Julie was a huge lover of animals, and a lot of her friends and family said that they assumed that she would go on to do something with animals for a living, like be a veterinarian or like our friend Catherine Edwards over in the United Kingdom do work with animals on more of a homeopathic level or a spiritual level but that's not what ended up happening Julie ended up getting married at a very young age and that first marriage or as we call it in today's society the starter marriage did end up in divorce but again both her and her ex-husband were very very young but in June of 1980, at 21 years old, Julie met Mike Wefflin at a jazz concert in Portland, Oregon. The couple hit it off. And two years later, Julie ended up moving up to Spokane, Washington to be with Mike. A year after she moved to Spokane, her and Mike were married. Mike Wefflin was a pretty successful house painter. And at this time, his new wife, his new bride, Julie, wanted to have a career of her own. And the reason why I brought up her uh, spine situation when she was 14 was because, in my opinion, the job she ended up picking was a very male-dominated 
active job. And it seems like for someone who's only 5'2 and only 100 pounds, who spent a lot of her childhood very much isolated and still because of some health issues, she then proceeded into her adult life to want to take an active career in order to use her body. And so she decided to get into power and electronics. After she was trained to do this really male dominated hard labor job, Julie became the only female in the area to be able to be an energy operator. She ended up getting a job at the Bonneville Power Administration or BPA for short. Now, again, at this time, Julie was the only female. And from what I understand, when she first started working, the issue of her being a female did rub some people the wrong way. But over a very short amount of time, all of her colleagues and peers ended up holding a lot of respect for Julie. Now, again, the reason why I bring this up is because this will come up later in her disappearance. Around 1 p.m. on September the 16th of 1987, a call came in to BPA saying, saying that the that Spring Hill substation was running low on nitrogen. Now, this in itself was not an emergency. And in fact, some of Julie's colleagues remember telling Julie that this was not something she needed to rush off and do on this particular day. It, it could wait a day or two. But Julie being a very very, very determined young woman who really wanted to make her way in this career, in this industry, decided to go ahead and go out there and replace the nitrogen. Now, again, this is 1987. So there are no cell phones. There is no GPS tracking devices. For the people like myself who lived during a time when there was no cell phones or tracking devices, I think we can reach back in our memory and, and remember what that was like. And in Julie's situation, because there was no tracking devices, because there was no cell phones, it would take a couple of hours, more than a couple hours, for people to actually realize that something was wrong. Julie parked her work-issued minivan into a gravel parking lot by the Spring Hill substation near Riverside State Park around 2 p.m. on September the 16th. Her colleagues guess that she probably finished up her work around 3.45 p.m. But as I just said, at 3.45 p.m. on September the 16th of 1987, no one would have known what was happening at that gravel parking lot by the Spring Hill substation in Spokane, Washington. Julie's husband, Mike, had been busy painting a house about 50 miles outside of Spokane that day. And it was customary for Mike to call Julie around 5 p.m. on their landline, because those were the only lines we had in 1987, to check in with her before making his drive back home. Well, that day on September the 16th, when Mike called his wife, no one picked the phone up. He called multiple times thinking maybe she was outside, maybe she was running a little bit late, but still he got no answer. Well, around the same time, there was a onlooker, a passerby that had noticed that the white minivan that was that belonged to BPA that Julie was driving was still sitting in this gravel parking lot and had been sitting there for hours. At that point, this stranger, this man who noticed the minivan, called the police to have them come inspect the car. When the police got to the car, they noticed that there were some personal items of Julie's on the outside of the car. This included her hard hat, her tool belt, a water bottle, sunglasses, all scattered around the car. They also noticed that there were some tire marks as if a car had just sped off and there were drag marks indicating that someone had dragged Julie away from her minivan and probably most likely put her into another car, the car that sped off according to the tire marks in the gravel parking lot. It was also apparent to the police that a struggle had taken place, not just because of the drag marks, but because the driver's side door had been left open, as if Julie was in the process of getting into the car when she was violently yanked out of the car, dropping her hard hat, her tool belt, and her sunglasses, and then again being pulled off into this other car. Now, investigators noticed that the tire marks from this other car that wasn't on the scene were headed east towards Seven Mile Bridge. 
And so the police very quickly put up a command station by Pine Bluff Road and Seven Mile Bridge. Now, for 48 hours, the police pretty much went balls to the wall looking for Julie. They brought in search dogs, but as soon as the dogs got into the park, they lost the scent of Julie. Now, I want to pause on this for a minute, because if you know anything about Washington State, you know that the terrain is very intensely nature, if you know what I'm talking about. This is not some skip through a trail. We're talking, if we know about Olympia State Park, all those Spokane's on the other side of Washington, we're talking hard, hard terrain. And so what, what most of us learned in our English literature classes growing up is that man versus nature, nature always wins. So the fact that the dogs lost the scent is not shocking. Again, man versus nature, nature will always win. After the command center was set up, the police had her ban taken all the way back to the crime lab to inspect it more. They also brought in more officers. Originally on the case from the very beginning, there were 12 officers, but 18 more were brought in to help with the search. They also employed two search helicopters and a Red Cross truck, which is very suspicious to me because the Red Cross ain't nothing but trouble. The FBI also sent an investigator from their bureau. And yeah, you know, that might be a bit of a red flag too, but it is what it is. Again, this was 1987. We also know that Julie's co-workers formed a search party as well with her husband, Mike Wefflin. Now, most people, especially if you're a true crime buff, would think that, oh, Mike, he must have been the main suspect because most of the time, the spouse is the main suspect. However, Mike was released as a suspect about a week after the abduction. And this was because Mike and Julie did seem to have a very, very happy marriage. This is also because Mike had a very solid alibi for the time of his wife's disappearance. And Mike would end up giving most of his life to finding his missing wife. Of course, now he is remarried and I believe he does have children with his second marriage. But for years, for years, he searched and searched and searched for Julie. And all the interviews I listened to, all the research I did into this case, it does seem that Mike really did love his wife. And in this case, I really agree with the police officers. I actually don't think he had anything to do with her abduction. Now, as I just said previously, the search for Julie lasted about 48 hours. After 48 hours, it was completely called off by the police department. There was literally no more evidence to go off of. Now, again, there weren't many witnesses in this area because this is a very secluded area, except for the witness who saw Julie's car sitting there for a while and originally called the police. And there was another witness or two that noticed a couple of cars in the area. One of these witnesses noticed a white sedan parked by the substation. Now, this was very peculiar to this witness. I think he figured this person must be lost. After all, this is by a state park. And but as this witness went up to the car to see if this person needed help, the driver sped off. Other people in the area saw a brown minivan with Oregon plates. Now, again, Julie is originally from Oregon. Her first husband was still in Oregon. The second husband, Mike Wefflin, has now been dismissed as a suspect, but the police were very interested to speak to Julie's ex-husband, her first husband. Now, as I said earlier, Julie and her first husband were married very young and then divorced very young. Again, nowadays, we call this a starter marriage. And typically, it does not end with one person abducting the other. But just to be on the safe side, of course, the police had to go look into this first husband, especially, again, since a brown van was spotted near the scene with Oregon plates. But it just so happens that Julie's first husband was about 300 miles away when this abduction took place. And so he, too, was quickly dismissed as a suspect. We also have to remember that Oregon is the state below Washington. I live in Georgia. I see a lot of plates from like Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, South Carolina, all the states that border this state 
you see other plates. I mean, the the oddest plate I think I've seen in the state of Georgia was one from uh, Ontario, Canada. It's a long drive. But um, but yeah, you just get used to seeing plates from other states, especially states that are neighboring your state. And again, this is a national park. So who's to say this wasn't a brown van full of a family going camping at this national park that literally had nothing to do with this abduction. And the only thing they had in common with the abductee, Julie, was the fact that maybe they were both originally from Oregon. Now, of course, at this time, the police received so many phone calls from people claiming they had seen Julie at bus stops, at camping sites. But according to the police, this was all mistaken identity. Again, Julie was 5'2", 100 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes. There are a lot of women out there who are 5'2", 100 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, especially women in their late 20s, especially at camping sites and stuff like that. So yes, a lot of these tips, these phone calls were just brushed off as mistaken identity. Now again, Julie's co-workers very much fought to find Julie. And for a long time, BPA did not seek a replacement for Julie's position. All of her colleagues decided to work overtime just on the hope that Julie would one day be found and would have a job to return to. They wanted that to be the case so bad that they even kept her desk intact for a year, a whole year after her abduction. Now, even though her colleagues and her employer all loved Julie. If you remember from the very beginning, I said that at first it was hard for Julie because she was taking a job in a very male dominated field. And so the police for a little while were a little bit suspect that maybe somebody at her work had it out for her, maybe a male chauvinist that doesn't think women can do this job, whatever the case may be. But that theory, again, quickly went by the wayside. All hope seemed lost until December of 1987, three months after Julie's abduction. At this point, a suspect was brought to the police's attention. Now, the name of this suspect has never been released. He was interviewed twice by the police, and he took a polygraph test, which he failed. At that point, this suspect lawyered up. Now, I'm going to say something about polygraph tests, and I've never taken a polygraph test, and God, I hope I never have to take one, because sometimes I fear that I would fail a polygraph test. Like, even if they were asking me simple questions like, what's your name? I would probably fail that because I would be so damn nervous taking that test. And so when I hear of somebody failing polygraph tests, it doesn't never really like affects me because it could just be nerves. And I know that in the court system, they're not admissible because of that reason. Now, the reason why this man became a suspect is because he lived very near and close to the substation where Julie had been abducted. He also was an acquaintance of a woman named Debbie Swanson. And Debbie Swanson was a school teacher who had gone missing as well. Debbie Swanson case like Julie Wefflin's case, still to this day remain unsolved. And this suspect was never arrested for the abduction of Julie Wefflin or Debbie Swanson. This man was also connected to a, another abduction, this of a woman named Sally Stone. Once again, all three of these cases remain unsolved. In 2007, 20 years after the abduction of Julie Wefflin, the suspect was brought back up again in connection to all three of these ladies. But unfortunately, at this point, the man had passed away. By 2011, BPA was fed up with not having any answers in Julie Wefflin's disappearance. No evidence whatsoever, no body, nothing. That they decided to start their own investigation. And the interesting thing that BPA found that was never confirmed or released by the police was that in the area alone, 50 women have gone missing. And that's a horrifying number for a town like Spokane, Washington. Now, yeah, there are a couple of serial killers that are from Spokane, Washington. And a lot of people have questioned maybe these women were part of killing sprees done by these notorious serial killers. However, through my investigation, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem that way. 
Because with serial killers, they have patterns, they have reasons, they have purposes. And these other abductions don't match the ones that have been attributed to these famous people. So if you're a conspiracy-minded person like I am, where did these 50 women go? Why is there no evidence left of them? 50 women who were daughters, sisters, mothers, best friends, women who had names, who had smiles, who had lives, dreams, hopes, and ambitions. And it's one thing to lose someone you love, but it's another thing to not know what happened. Now, I don't believe that Julie Wefflin is still alive, especially 35 years later with no trace. And I do hope that wherever Julie is, wherever her spirit is, her soul is, that she is resting in peace. And I do hope that her friends and her family and her beloved husband, Mike, have been able to have some sort of healing. All right, guys, thank you for listening. Please leave me your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. What do you think happened to Julie? No, I don't think we're going to be doing any card readings on Julie unless one of her family members gives us permission to look into the divination for her. I know that sometimes the police officers will use psychics and mediums to help them with cases and that's fine for them. But for me as just a content creator on YouTube, I really wanna be careful about not getting too much onto the entertainment side of these stories because these are human beings. And for some reason, Julie's case really hit me hard when I was researching her. Just looking at pictures of her, even though when she went missing, she was 11 years younger than I am now, I just recognized a young woman who, who was in love with her husband and had this job she was conquering. And I just felt so much pain for her life and her story ending so soon. I felt pain for the children that she never got to have with Mike. I felt pain for her parents and of course, for Mike, for her husband. And so only unless someone from the Wefflin family wanted us to pull cards would I do it because I do want to respect that. And I don't want to make a mockery out of this case. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from with that. All right. With that being said, tomorrow is our part nine, our final installation on this book, uh, Mary Magdalene Revealed, that we're covering in the Magdalene series. And next week, we will be starting the Magdalene Manuscript, a whole new book on our Magdalene series here on YouTube. Please keep your head held high and know that the best is truly yet to come.